What an extraordinarily intimidating introduction. Um, well, I have to say, I was uh, very pleased with the way uh, Dr. Ordnaut finished it off at the end. That's absolutely right. It's um, grace at the end of the day, which has become my passion. Um, I have to say, that wasn't always the case. Uh, so when I was a teenager, my ambition was to become an astronaut. And unfortunately, in England, we don't have many job opportunities for astronauts. Um, you have to live somewhere like Houston for that. So my teachers persuaded me to look elsewhere. And because I couldn't make up my mind, I eventually um, chose physics. Because with physics, I thought I could then um, sooner or later move into some other field. I wasn't quite sure. F physics underpins a lot of other sciences. Um, and I spent a few years smashing particles in Geneva. And then I discovered people were more interesting than particles. <laughs> Seven years in business after that. And then, um, you might say God made me an offer I couldn't refuse. But because I was a, a businessman, I did a cost-benefit analysis. So basically, I was, I was called to the priesthood. And um, I thought about the costs and benefits. And the thing is, is that if you, many of you will have smartphones. Is that true? Probably all of you have smartphones. Um, but it's, a, it's a work of genius, the amount of, of uh, engineering precision, the, 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 the person hours, the money that's gone into those smartphones. And it'll all be obsolete in a few years. Um, but if you invest in the soul, that's forever. So um, handle the technology. It's very, very important. Do, do, do good work whatever, in whatever you do. But... Uh, don't forget, investing in the soul is the best investment you can make. So, um, oh, to the topic of the talk. Okay, so it's science and divine action, and um, this talk is part of a bigger project. We're running a three-year project at Oxford University, and one of our main collaborators is the Texas Center for Applied Technology. And uh, as Neil pointed out, I do like to try to compress things into into digestible chunks. So we summarized the project as a three-minute video. So I thought I'd start with a three-minute video. And this was prepared for, for people without faith, um, or who might have faith, but really just to interest them intellectually in the topic. So uh, this is our little project video. Is every thought, is every action in the cosmos only an effect of some other thought or some other action in the cosmos? Or is there something more? Is there divine intervention? Is there divine inspiration? One fact is certain. Belief in these special divine actions has had an immense impact on human society and civilization. Such beliefs shape, often decisively, the way we think about the world, what we do in the world, and what we hope for now and in the future. Human beings have given many names to the various purported effects of special divine action, including grace, inspiration, miracles, and providence. The interpretations of such effects, their possible causes and reasons, are among the most important challenges we face as individual persons and in our societies today. Is special divine action possible? And if so, how would we know? What views are held about the kinds, causes, and implications of such actions? How does purported special divine action fit with our observations and with our philosophical, religious, and scientific worldviews? Are there advantages or disadvantages to holding particular beliefs about these matters? Does science explain or explain away special divine action? Can new research provide insights and metaphors for such action? The exploration of these topics also encourages us to reflect on other major questions in science, philosophy, and theology, such as the meaning of causation, of action and potential, of information and cognition, and of what it means to be a person. 
Such issues have been examined many times since the development of modern science, but much of what has been written in recent centuries is surprisingly little read today. With the help of new digital humanities technology, the Special Divine Action Project at Oxford University aims to recover the wisdom of the past on these questions and to bring this wisdom into dialogue with contemporary work in science, philosophy, religious studies, and theology. Conferences, courses, competitions, debates, and presentations will stimulate new research. Summaries, videos, and digital tools will provide resources for academics, teachers, students, and the broader public. By enabling access to past wisdom and contemporary research into the issues of special divine action, this project will promote new intellectual engagement with one of the greatest spiritual and intellectual quests of humanity. It's about three minutes, and that's what we're aiming for. Eventually, we want to have more videos and get our key messages across in about three minutes, which is about the attention time, maximum attention time, that people will give videos on YouTube. Um, so uh, it's quite challenging. OK, that's the project. And now what I want to do in the talk itself is to give you um, a few edited highlights from our work so far. But first of all, I want to clear, do a bit of ground clearing on this whole issue of science and faith. Um, why is this an issue? Do you mind if I ask a few questions? Is that okay? Has it gone on? Okay. So why is this an issue today, science and faith? I didn't want to suggest. Yes. Yes. Okay, yes, that, that's, there, there is that. Yes, uh, yes, sir. Right, yes. So d different worlds of discourse, different worlds, ways of gathering truth. Um, what's the impression you might get in this country about science and faith? Yes. Right, right. That's exactly the issue. And it starts very early. So often in schools in England, I'll talk to students about 12 years old. And I'll ask them, the science and faith, um, what's, um, how, how are they related? What's the link? And they'll tell me that science and faith are against one another. You can't be both a scientist and a person of faith. And then I'll ask them, well, that's interesting. What is, what is science? And they don't know. Then they ask them, what's faith? They don't know that either. But they have already picked up that science and faith are, must be at war, at a conflict. So we have a big problem. Um, and uh, it's very important to just know a few basic facts. So before talking about divine action itself, I want to just do a bit of ground clearing just to... Um, give you a bit of general knowledge on, the, on things that you need to know about. Um, so who is this gentleman? And who is this gentleman? Very nice. There they are together. Did anyone... Uh, so... The lady here said um, he introduced the Big Bang Theory. Yes, he invented the Big Bang Theory. What was his other job, do you think? It's a priest. Just checking, did you all know that a priest invented the Big Bang Theory? Some of you do. Okay, this is good. This is more than most audiences. I spoke to a group of head teachers in England um, recently, and two-thirds of them had never, had never heard of this. And um, they were quite shocked. Uh, because uh, certainly in the, in the media in England, we don't get told these things very often. In fact, I did, I, I, I did my doctorate in physics without really appreciating um, 
that uh, the theory had been invented by a priest. What was also interesting was how the theory was received. Um, how did the church receive it? How did the Catholic church receive it, in particular, as a Catholic priest? Some people say not well, a bit mixture. Yeah, actually it was, um, uh, the priest was made um, head of the Pontifical Academy of Science, which I don't think is persecution. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> How was it received in the Soviet Union? Anyone know that? In 1948, a group of astronomers in the Soviet Union were gathered together. They were told we must oppose the Big Bang Theory because, they said, it's encouraging clericalism. It's encouraging the priests. And it was effectively banned for 30 years in the Soviet Union. Again, do you know this history? It's, it's fascinating. Um, there was another theory banned in the Soviet Union, also associated with a cleric. I'll come to that in a moment. And that was genetics. Genetics was invented by a monk. And um, some people died in the Soviet Union because they were supporting uh, supporters of Mendelian genetics. Uh, genetic, this, by the way, the, the theory of Mendelian genetics has given us the ability to feed the world, by the way, because we can now manipulate um, uh, genes and we can help to boost crop yields. And these are a few names. So in England, uh, some years ago, I started to design posters for schools because... Clearly, this information isn't getting out. And the problem is, is, it's a shame to have to do such basic things. But they are important because the message getting to, to, the, to the minds of the children is that um, faith and science are incompatible. So you've got to know some counterexamples. Um, and uh, as, as a Catholic priest, we put this, this poster series together called the Catholic Knowledge Network. First woman professor of mathematics, uh, appointed by Pope Benedict XIV in 1750. The God of Bingham, the various other names that I thought our students need to know about. And, and um, you see, the problem is the grand narrative of our culture is that faith and science are hostile, and if you're a person of faith, you should retreat to the margins and practice your religion in peace. It, it, you know, be left alone, but just don't bother society. You get out, get into a little corner, right? But in fact, um, we've got to change the narrative around. I mean, faith has built our civilization, our literature, our art, our music, so many persons of science, our institutions, our laws. And without um, boasting, we've got to have a certain confidence in all of this. It's very important for us to know our past, our history, the history of ideas, philosophy, and so on. And, um, and to have a certain cultural confidence about these things uh, and, and to educate ourselves. Okay, so that's just the preliminaries. And if you want to know about these posters, they're available online um, from uh, our publisher in England. Okay, so main talk, science and divine action. I want to talk mainly today about um, four, uh, four kinds of divine action, miracles, providence, grace, and inspiration. Um, when people talk about the science of divine action and science, they normally just think about miracles. And, um, but actually, the others are probably more important, particularly grace. Now, what do we mean by here by divine action? Now, sometimes um, on the project in England, we refer to it as special divine action. But the general idea is this. is divine action refers to acts of God beyond establishing the existence and parameters of the cosmos beyond establishing the existence and parameters of the cosmos. See, in one sense, it's quite easy to infer God in the sense of a first cause um, from the cosmos. In fact, there are all kinds of philosophical arguments, uh, cosmological arguments about this. But the real topic of interest for people of faith, actually for every human being, is not just whether God created the world, but also... Uh, whether God interacts with the world. And this is really the key, the key issue. And, and although miracles have been the main topic of interest for philosophers, uh, theology and practice deals with this broader categorization, grace, inspiration, and providence. So miracles first. Um, just a general, a general practice with any difficult concept. It's worth spending some time defining words. 
Um, if you don't already do this um, in your essays, uh, in your papers, I do recommend that, that you, you, you concentrate hard on defining words. Because if you can get the definitions right, you often find that half the argument's already done, providing uh, the words are properly defined. Maybe I exaggerate slightly. Okay, so the word miracle comes from a Latin word miraculum, meaning an object of wonder. And it implies a contrast with a background, an event which is remarkable and different from what is experienced ordinarily. But wonder alone, however, is not enough to specify a miracle. So St. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century observed, an astronomer is not astonished when he sees an eclipse of the sun, since the astronomer knows the cause. So what else is needed to specify a miracle? Well, Aquinas' definition... Um, is that a miracle exceeds the productive power of nature, exceeds the productive power of nature. So a proper, a proper miracle has a cause that's unknowable, even in principle, because he says the divine essence is unknowable, even in principle, in this life. Now, by this approach, um, one could categorize different grades of purported miracles, um, generally by the mode of excess. So the most, one of the most spectacular ones in the Bible is um, Joshua, um, commanding the sun and moon to stop in the heavens. And then on the other hand, there seem to be more everyday sort of miracles where Jesus cures the um, mother-in-law of Simon Peter of a fever, for example. And sometimes um, some reported miracles are so extraordinary that one can't um, almost fail to believe them. So obviously uh, the disciples seeing Jesus at the supper at Emmaus or indeed, the story of Doubting Thomas. Uh, here, actually, Caravaggio has portrayed Thomas actually performing the test that he had demanded for belief in the resurrection. Though we're not actually told in Scripture whether he did any more than fall to his knees and say, my Lord and my God. Now, what about breaking the laws of nature? Now, the definition of miracle, as it's been often um, expressed for the last few centuries, is a definition that's been made famous by David Hume. It's an, an inquiry concerning human understanding. And the way he describes a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature. A violation of the laws of nature. And David Hume, you might say, is, um, is a sort of master opponent in this whole area of, 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 of miracles. And it fascinates me, this definition. It's so destructive. It's such a, a very, very clever way of misleading uh, on the topic of miracles. Incidentally, it would make God into a lawbreaker. It makes God into a lawbreaker if this definition is correct. Um, but it's, it's the starting point of a lot of inquiries today. If you want a critique of it, I recommend my colleague, uh, um, Professor Timothy McGrew, who's written the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy article on miracles. And a lot of it's about the human definition and responding to the human definition. And to give an example of some of the problems, um, a good definition should define no more and no less than the thing we want to define. But if we refer to miracles as violating the laws of nature, the problem is it's not always easy to identify what laws are being violated in specific cases. Moreover, there are disagreements today about the meaning and efficacy of natural laws. Um, but another thing, and this is where modern science has, uh, science has changed over the last um, couple of centuries. Although there's an, uh, a law-like nurse in a lot of nature, um, there's a lot of things that are acceptable, acceptably natural that are not, uh, not, that are not, uh, that don't fall within the scope of law-like behavior. And one way I like to think about this, you think in your mind's eye of the the carbon atom on the, on the tip of a horn of a galloping rhinoceros. So imagine it in space. It's, it's not behaving like a free atom in space. It's behaving like an atom on the tip of a horn of a galloping rhinoceros. Um, and you can't express that behavior in a totally law-like way. Um, it's, the atom there is part of, uh, of something else. Remember, the laws of physics apply to an idealized case, an idealized case um, which actually never happens completely in nature, of, of some complete isolated two-body system normally uh, with nothing else in the cosmos. 
Um, and it's a very useful approximation for certain things. It helps us to navigate spacecraft, for example. But um, there's a lot of nature which, which isn't like that. Now, why reject the no miracles heuristic? So sometimes uh, in popular books on science, you might see a phrase like, um, we start from the basis that miracles are impossible. We start from the basis that miracles are impossible. One, well, certainly uh, even someone who believes in miracles will not normally say that they happen all the time. Um, but certainly the spectacular ones are rare, practically by definition. But they're not ruled out by science or by philosophy. Um, nor does accepting the possibility of miracles undermine science. On the contrary, possible validation of miracles requires first um, assessing and then ruling out um, alternative natural causes. So in fact, um, some of the skills we need, a lot of the skills we need to do good experimental work uh, and also to adjudicate miracles are actually very similar. And if you look back at the history of the development of early scientific ideas, in the 13th century, you find the two things developed together. Um, the detailed philosophy of miracles in the work of Aquinas, but also work on early experimental method with people like Roger Bacon at Oxford. So um, the possibility of miracles doesn't itself, um, uh, need not itself uh, undermine science. But also, if you accept the no miracles rule, and this is a, if you might accept it as a premise, not as a proof, as a premise, um, then it can backfire. And if the universe is wholly law-like, or even machine-like, um, what is a human being apart from a remarkably complex cog? So, in other words, the arguments used to exclude divine action are very easily turned back on us to exclude human action. Now, of course, um, if there is some law, some mechanism by which divine action is impossible, well, you know, we may have to take the implications of that seriously, but we should be very slow to accept um, as a premise something which also backfires on ourselves with it, unless there's a good reason to do so. But finally, of course, the world of natural causes appears to lack sufficient resources to make us perfectly and permanently happy. And out of enlightened self-interest and inspired by Pascal's wager, it seems foolish, therefore, to treat the exclusion of miracles as a premise. And um, basically speaking, if the natural world is all there is, and there's no divine event intervention ever, any time, and we're on our own in a sort of deistic void or an atheistic void, that's it. Um, there's nothing beyond, uh, there's, there's no hope for us in the, the longer term. Okay, I'll speak a little bit about providence. A providence is from a word that means to foresee, conveying the, notion of, uh, conveying the notion of divine direction of the cosmos and human affairs with wise benevolence. Now, in a providential cosmos or a providential life, time is not simply a succession of moments, like a ticking of a clock, but takes on a more organic meaning, marking progress or growth towards a fruitful goal. By the way, this is a theme I quite often use in homilies. I invite people to think about how they treat time, because... There's a lot of pressure today to treat time just as a succession of moments and to fill up time with meaningless activity. Um, one trivial thing to another trivial thing to another trivial thing to another trivial thing. I always remind people, one day it would stop. It would just be cut off. And, and it's important to think, I think, of time more as growth towards a harvest, uh, growth towards some fruitful goal. So even for, from our personal perspective, it's good to have a providential view uh, of life. Now, the whole question of whether life, there is providence in the world, it's a very complicated one, and it overlaps with other issues that are very controversial in philosophy and science. So I've got a few of them here, I think. So, um, in philosophy, there have been a lot of debates in recent centuries about what's called end-directed action or teleology, a lot of debates about free will, which is another kind of end-directed action. And then um, these things overlap with uh, work on complex systems, um, end direction action in biology, things we discover in neuroscience, and then the whole area of divine action, and providence, uh, predestination. So all these areas are a bit controversial, and they all kind of overlap uh, somewhat. Now, as is well known, end directed action, uh, which if God is foreseeing it, it's called providential action, 
um, was not a popular concept in early modern science. So, in fact, it's one of, if you look at the, the early works of, um, in, in science and the commentators on science, people like Descartes, they were not very keen on, t on teleology, on end-directed action. But starting from about 1900, um, the concept of end-directed action has crept back into physics uh, one way or another, um, partly through um, things like entropy, which gives an arrow to time, uh, partly feedback systems, electromagnetic, uh, electromechanical uh, systems. There are also a few oddities in, in particle physics, which you just don't understand, something called the neutral kaon system. And um, naturally, um, we also discovered really simple mechanical systems uh, exhibit end-directed action. This was a revelation for me. I hadn't realized with physics, I studied, I studied physics for six years at Oxford. I hadn't realized that uh, almost everything we study in physics is the behavior of a two-body system. Um, now, of course, many, many of, the, of the things we look at are more complex, but we treat them as aggregates of two-body systems, um, or things that we can approximate as two-body systems. Now, there are some systems for which this works, like the solar system. So the solar system, we can treat each planet acting independently of the other planets. So the sun can be treated as, as interacting on each planet in isolation. We put the whole lot together, and we get a pretty good mathematical picture of the solar system. But what people don't know, most, most people don't know, is that um, Sir Isaac Newton failed to integrate the three-body system, the Earth-Moon-Sun uh, system. We now discover that kind of system can't be integrated, uh, except in a few special cases or by mathematical approximations. And in the last 40 years, since powerful computers have become available, we've been able to simulate some of these systems. And one of the strange things we discover is end-directed action. So uh, this is um, one of the most famous of all these uh, uh, systems, the, the uh, Lorentz attractor. And we now discover there are many of these sorts of things. But they, they introduce, reintroduce an arrow of time into, into uh, mechanical systems. Now, the strange thing about this is that the last few centuries, we've taken the mechanical way of looking at the world, and we've gradually extended it into all kinds of other areas. We treated biology as just you know, living machines, and even human beings as meat machines. Um, uh, but now, if you like, the metaphor's working the other way. Uh, we take the kind of behavior we see in biological systems, it's moving into the mechanical realm. We see end-directed action even in quite simple, complex systems. It's changing the way we imagine the world from, how, from, a, from, from a couple of centuries ago. Now, this doesn't prove providence. These are two different things. But it may shape the way we think about providence, um, God as a gardener rather than a watchmaker. And belief in providence can also shape the way we think about the world. For example, providence implies a direction to time and history, underpinning the idea of progress and a confidence to seek order in creation with an expectation of success. I also speculate, although this is still at an early stage, that um, this way of thinking, this organic metaphor, may help to think about pre us to think about predestination. Um, those of you who debate the philosophy of Christianity will will um, be familiar with some of the controversies over predestination. I'd like to suggest that a living plant has end-directed action without such action being a prediction that the plant will actually bear fruit uh, rather than being cut off. So um, it, uh, this whole organic way of thinking may give us a slightly richer way of thinking about this notion of predestination. Or another way of thinking about it is holiness is cultivated, not manufactured. Okay, there's a few ideas from providence. Now I want to talk about grace. And this has actually um, become the most important theme in, in my theological reflections the last 15 years. Um, anyone can, can anyone define grace for me? I'm just curious. Yes. God's favor. Okay, yes. Okay, so God's favor being given something you don't deserve. These are okay, but um, the problem is but they're not specific enough, but thank you, but thank you, because um, God could give me a birthday cake I don't deserve, but that's not grace. Right? <laughs> yes. 
Oh. Please, go ahead. Simple elegance for fine movement. So, so that's a very nice element to grace. Um, graceful, yes. Oh, life of God. Oh, that's nice. I'm going to write that down. Okay, life of God within our soul. Yes. Okay. Thank you for all of that. Um, it's an important concept. Uh, the word is used over 101 times by St. Paul. Now, we could interpret some senses in which the word is used in a sort of everyday sense. But in many places, it seems he is referring to some special principle and gift related to divine action. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Or, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Incidentally, there's a lot of controversies uh, in the early days of the Reformation between Catholics and Protestants on the question of, of grace. And um, if you look at Tyndale's translation of the New Testament, um, the angel says to Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace. When you get to the New King, the, sorry, the King James Version, it's Hail, O favored one. Um, so there's been a slight shift of grace um, away from life towards favor. And that's often how it's considered uh, today. The meaning of grace at the heart of an extraordinary range of historical or present-day controversies, in my judgment, is the foremost issue in theology, indeed a, a key re reason for the existence of theology as a discipline. Now, um, what I've discovered, um, dealing with a lot of um, Protestant Christians over, over many years at Oxford and also here in the United States, is that sometimes the same idea, more or less the same idea, is expressed using different language. So quite often... What a Protestant means by faith, um, you could almost link, you could link quite close to what a Catholic means by grace. It's the thing you need to be saved. And um, quite often, uh, uh, you might say, uh, I've, I've, the, the, the definition of grace as favor is quite often heard in non-Catholic circles, but the same circles will also refer to grace, refer to the concept of being born again. Have you heard that phrase, being born again? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, good. So, um, roughly speaking, the life of grace in, in, in Catholic circles equates roughly to the notion of being born again in certain uh, non-Catholic circles. Now, in the high Middle Ages, this became called the supernatural life. The supernatural life. That's actually that's where, the, where the phrase supernatural came into regular discourse. And actually, in the late, in the early 20th century, um, a corrupted version was introduced by Nietzsche. And there were many cultural offshoots from that, or that whole way of thinking, including Superman and um, all kinds of superheroes uh, in uh, uh, American cultural life. Um, but the original idea was an elevated or changed state of nature uh, in, in Christianity. And we can see this in all kinds of things. You can see this in the distinction, the setting apart of the Jewish people in the Old Testament. Um, one of my favorite parables, the parable of the sower, because the ground, you know the parable of the sower, the ground represents nature. The seed is something that transforms nature. And so you get the idea of the supernatural life. Um, come back to this bit point later, but the... Uh, two most famous recent councils of the Catholic Church, the First and Second Vatican Council. The First Vatican Council warned that the rejection of the supernatural life would not lead to the possibility of a naturally good life, but actually there'll be a movement to destroy rational human nature, uh, which I think we can see happening now. So, um, ideally, the life of grace follows something of the pattern of the life of nature. There's a birth, um, which we would call baptism, and then there are, um, there's a kind of food and drink, a society, and a goal. Now, uh, in, in Catholic circles, um, the distinction between the natural and supernatural life was defended very strongly until the 1950s, and then kind of imploded over the next 20 years. And there's a very confused state of theology today, and, this, um, it, of, and there have been parallel effects in non-Catholic circles. Also up to the 1950s, the dominant metaphor for describing the difference between the life of nature and the life of grace was one of elevation. 
The supernatural life was described as a higher version of the natural life, which turns a difference of kind into a difference of degree. And this difference was parodied as a two-tier flourishing. And that weakness contributed to its implosion between 1950 and 1970. So one of the intellectual questions that's obsessed me in the last few years is how to understand, how to get a better metaphor for the life of grace and how to relate it to the life of nature. And I suddenly realized um, when I was doing my uh, uh, doctorate in philosophy that Thomas Aquinas gave us a map of the supernatural life. Um, have any of you studied Aquinas at all? Uh, Thomas Aquinas a bit? Okay. Anyone, anyone applying reason to matters of faith ought to study at some point a bit of Aquinas. And what does he most, anyone know what he's most famous for? Uh, his proofs. His proofs, of, yes. The five proofs of existence of God. That's normally the first thing people hear about when they hear about Aquinas when he's introduced in philosophy classes. Uh, and I always point out that's one article of the Summa Theologiae. That's one article. He wrote over 3,000 articles. <laughs> And a thousand of them were on the life of virtue and, um, uh, and, and the other things connected with virtue, what we might call the life, the supernatural life of grace. Um, so I spent years um, looking through this and trying to figure out what he's talking about. And what is interesting is that this is the Christian version of, of a great work of philosophy called the Nicomachean Ethics. In the ancient world, um, the Greek philosophers were interested in the good life. What does it mean to flourish as a human being? And the summit of their work, the work that's, that's affected the whole history of ethics since then, the summit of that work was the Nicomachean ethics of Aristotle. It's still, if you like, the ground text for a lot of um, the entire uh, history of ethics ever since. And Christianity produced its own version of the Nicomachean ethics, uh, but most people don't know this. But Aquinas wrote his own map of how did, what it means to flourish as a human being. And he integrated certain aspects of revelation along with virtues. Uh, he never met a list he didn't like. He never met a list he didn't take seriously from Scripture. And he was interested in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the Beatitudes, and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And he put all these together into this giant, um, uh, this giant sort of analytic map of what it means to be a saint, basically. So he takes virtues and he links them to gifts of the Holy Spirit, beatitudes and fruits. The whole thing, um, I'd say more than a thousand articles. And how can we get a picture of what he's doing? What's a simple metaphor for what he's doing? And the key actually turns out to be what he describes as the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And it... it so if you think about virtue, if this was, um, if an object was something like a chocolate cake there, and a person with the right kind of temperance on the left-hand side, that person would act temperately towards uh, the chocolate cake. Um, but the gifts work differently. This is how Aquinas describes them. This is how Aquinas describes them. So a person with the gifts and virtues has a certain stance towards an object, but is also moved by God with respect to the object, moved by God with respect to the object. And the question is how to understand that movement. And it turns out that actually there are very simple examples. And we see it in the behavior of young children. And we see it when they point. For those of you who young, have, have young children, uh, maybe familiar with the way they point things out, they start asking questions, um, what's that, and so on. And pointing is something we take for granted in children. And it's only when it's missing that we, um, we start to worry. This, this, this pointing and, and things like this are what psychologists now call joint attention, uh, a shared awareness of the sharing of focus, sharing an attitude towards the event or thing in question. Shared awareness or shared focus, sharing an attitude towards the thing or event in question. And what has put this work on an empirical basis? We've discovered that s some, some persons um, don't quite behave in the typical way with regard to joint attention. And uh, there's a very famous book by a mother bringing up an autistic child, and it's called The Siege by Clara Claiborne Park. And at the age of two, she realized she wasn't seeing her child doing any pointing. And she began to worry about this, and, um, 
and what to do about it. Now, um, what was rather beautiful was to discover that all this work being done in, in psychology today links very much to how Aquinas described the virtues and gifts in the 13th century. And you might describe it like this. The life of grace puts us into joint attention with God. Uh, second person relatedness to God. An I thou relationship to God. That's how to think of it metaphorically. And this also teaches us why grace is important. Because you might say that we're, that we're born, we have this innate condition, a near universal condition of a kind of spiritual autism with respect to God. And I'll show you an example of this. So um, Aristotle, back in the time of the ancient Greeks, he, he, he was not, a, not an atheist, as we would call him today. Um, he talks quite a bit about God. And here's one example. We say, we say, therefore, that God is a living being, eternal, most good, so that life and duration, continuous and eternal, belong to God, for this is God. I think no, one, no Christian would disagree with this, and um, it's interesting he's doing it just by observation of the natural world and rigorous philosophy. But what he never addresses, he never does, is he never addresses God as you. And seven centuries later, Augustine, living at the end of the Roman Empire, um, wrote his Confessions, the story of his conversion. And this is the kind of language he uses. Late have I loved you, beauty so ancient and so new. Late have I loved you. I tasted you, and now I hunger and thirst for you. You touched me, and I have burned for your peace. It's not the existence of God that's changed. It's the way of relating to God that's changed. And what you might say is that it's now a second-person relationship or the spiritual autism with which we're all born has been dispelled, uh, bringing us into uh, an I thou relationship with God. So that's basically um, a metaphor for thinking about the life of grace. And it, I don't have time now, but it'll be, it's an extraordinary, an extraordinary set of implications for our civilization result from this, because Augustine emerges as an I, as a personality in relationship to God who has become known as a person. I think it's also very useful for thinking of all kinds of other things. Um, one, one problem in philosophy of, uh, of, of, of faith is often um, whether God's causation and our causation are at work and how these things um, interact with one another. But with joint attention, it's not like that. It, it's, it's a shared you know, interaction, a shared awareness of shared focus. So it helps to get us get us out of that zero-sum game. I also think it's a way of understanding the fruits of the Holy Spirit. You can think of them as, as the resonances. Um, those of you who study physics will be very familiar with the idea of resonance. But I think that uh, persons can resonate as well uh, when they're perfectly aligned. And the fruits of the Holy Spirit could be interpreted uh, in those terms. Um, I won't go into this here, but it's a, it's a lovely description of how uh, this is Aquinas' description of benignity, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, in which a person melts to relieve the needs of others. Now, what's curious here is the science has informed the theological understanding, but the theology in turn helps us to think again about what we're discovering in psychology. One of the interesting things is um, the growth, uh, we're able to start putting together lots of unusual observations in psychology. And here's a, here's a fun one. So if, if any of you live in a shared building and you've got an honesty box to pay for drinks or whatever, um, if you put a pair of eyes over the honesty box, people are more honest. And... Um, it doesn't have to be a, it just a, literally a picture of a pair of eyes um, causes a measurable change in people's um, dispositions. So somehow the relation to another person changes our moral dispositions. And also, I've got several nieces. It's very interesting to see how they first acquire temperance, and then they're not good Aristotelians. Um, uh, in fact, often they're not even interested in the food, uh, but they are interested very much in the game with the parents. So um, temperance is often, first of all, developed through a second-person relationship. I think over time this will contribute to a Copernican revolution in the virtues, a shift to the second-person perspective. And incidentally, if you want to behave badly, um, 
uh, one of the sh ways of doing it is to put a mask on. So in Venice, um, uh, during the carnival, people like to lose some of their inhibitions. And so one, one sure way of doing it is to departicularize the face. And um, I've, written more, I've written more work on this in my book on the second person perspective in Aquinas. Okay, so that's grace. I've got about 10 minutes or so left. I want to just look briefly at, at inspiration. Um, now, inspiration has different definitions. I'm going to focus here on inspiration as divine illumination. So all kinds of metaphors of light. And it has a slightly more secular cousin called insight. And they're both very difficult to analyze. One of the reasons is that they're, they're all at once. So someone could be toiling away at a problem for years and then suddenly, bang, aha, I see it. In cartoons, you sometimes see a light bulb going off across the head, you know, like that. And this sort of phenomenon seems to pay, play a very strong role in conversion stories. I'm giving you here a fictional account, but nevertheless, it's very typical of the kind of uh, conversions that happen. So from C.S. Lewis, a book called That Hideous Strength, what awaited her was, was serious to the degree of sorrow and beyond. There was no form nor sound. The mold under the bushes, the moss on the path, the little brick border were not visibly changed, but they were changed. A boundary had been crossed. She had come into a world or into a person or into the presence of a person. Something expectant, patient, inexorable met her with no veil or protection between. Um, so here we've got the idea of nothing changing in the sense of what one sees, but the perspective on it suddenly switching completely. And it's difference between seeing and seeing as. And seeing as is like a light switch being thrown, a door into daylight opening into a dark room, someone who's blind suddenly receiving sight. And this is by no means limited, you might say, to, to religious experiences. It happened a lot in science and engineering. Uh, I was just described, um, heard uh, a scientist just a few days ago explain, working at CERN, explaining how she was trying to solve this problem for months, and then suddenly woke up uh, in the middle of the night, bang, got it, had to solve the problem. And we, we have a very poor grasp on this. Um, so the, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which has become a kind of Bible for philosophers online, um, has at the moment no article on understanding. Uh, though apparently one is planned. I was just talking to the editor um, yesterday. Um, so there's, there's no article on understanding, um, and, it's linked, and this overlaps with the idea of inspiration. Uh, and some people think it also overlaps with the idea of the right hemisphere cognition, gestalt perception. Just see if we've got a picture here. So this is um, left and right brain. There's a, there's a wonderful book. Uh, um, by Ian McGilchrist. It's called The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World. And it's very fascinating looking at how, because um, we're, we're all carrying the most complex known object in the universe on top of our shoulders. But one of the interesting things about it is that it's almost entirely divided into two hemispheres. And the corpus callosum linking the two, to some extent, inhibits communication between the two. So um, uh, this is, there's got to be a reason for this. Why, why is a brain divide into these two into these two halves. And, and one of the most interesting books on this subject is called The Master and His Emissary. And one of the one of the curious things is is that for most people is the right hemisphere seems to get the sense of the whole. Um, the left hemisphere seems to uh, be the way in which the tool we use to grasp detail of things. And you can actually see this uh, a difference when one or other hemisphere isn't working properly. Or you can see this in illusions, illusions when you can't grasp the picture all at once. You have to take it at different angles. I won't go into this, but I just wanted to point out very briefly it, um, this, this, uh, this understanding of seeing as. It's very important in all kinds of uh, scientific operations, seeing a straight line uh, in a set of points and so on. Um, now, we can't generate insights at will, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but what we can do... What we can do is set up favorable conditions for, for insights. And many of these involve social interaction with other persons with different insights. And there's a kind of, there's a need for a certain amount of epistemic humility in this um, to, to let go of one's existing representations of the world, to be open to new presentations of the world. Um, there's a beautiful passage about this in Jane Austen's Mansfield Park about um, 
uh, Edmund teaching Fanny, um, uh, giving her reading, uh, and, and the way the way that um, Jane Austen describes the teaching process as, almost as a way of accelerating insights. I spent a long time thinking about the problem of social insight, and I discovered that actually Hans Christian Andersen got there first. So really all you need to know about this is summarized in a beautiful short parable called The Snow Queen. Anyone seen the, uh, heard of the film Frozen? Yeah, okay, <laughs> of course. I'm sorry, it's a bit, bit Disney-fied, but the, the original is, is very powerful, and I've been thinking about it since I was eight years old, and only just a few months ago did I understand what it was all about. So um, this little boy called Kai has caught evil splinters in his eye and in his heart, and these, these splinters render goodness and beauty invisible. It makes his heart cold. He admires geometric things. Um, he boasts that he knows his multiplication tables, can figure in fractions, knows the area and square miles of every country in Europe and its population. He's a, a rationalistic prig. Um, and in this cold state, um, he's carried away by the Snow Queen to her palace, at the center of which is a frozen lake the Snow Queen describes as the mirror of reason. So there he is, one of the many illustrations. And, and here, uh, he's condemned to look at this, uh, he, he's look, look down and try to arrange flat pieces of ice into, into a word, the word's eternity. And he's frozen, but he doesn't know he's frozen because his heart's cold and he's just busy arranging these blocks of ice. He's trapped in this state. And of course, in the story, um, it's the little girl, Gerda, who goes hunting for him, and she eventually finds her way into the palace and finds K Kay, and her tears melt the splinter in his eye and in his heart. And suddenly, he can see. He can see... Um, uh, he can see her, he can see where he is, and he can also solve the problem. Um, the, the, the blocks rearrange themselves. And with this, the spell is broken, he's able to walk out of the palace. And basically, this, this beautiful parable describes how insight works um, and how we have to let go of our frozen representations of the world to accept new insights and often come through a second person. So in the academy, um, in this very serious place of numbers and quantities and equations and engineering, a very good strategy is to mix with colleagues in different fields and listen respectfully to those with different perspectives and expertise. There's a book called um, Social Physics recently. I don't think it's that brilliant on this, but there are a few interesting passages near the beginning about someone at MIT. When, he, when he's stuck for how to solve a problem. He goes out and talks to someone in a completely different field, maybe in classics, or an artist or something, but just gets out of the state of just being trapped in the problem. And I think amid the, de the deadly earnestness of the modern academy, there's a great need to rediscover the value of intellectual play, especially in dialogue with others, to break the ice of frozen representations that forms quickly over cognition of the world. But also, this gives us the following rather counterintuitive course of action from promoting insights. If there is a God, of course I think there is, who desires to communicate understanding to us, which I think he does, then such insights are going to arise principally in the context of practices that foster an IU relationship with God. Such practices may include divinely revealed narratives of special divine action, liturgies, sacred art, and perhaps via harmonization on a subliminal level, sacred music. Just be careful what goes into your ears. I mean, it's too much of the dum 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 dum. <laughs> That's fine for building pyramids, um, but there is a slight danger that the the higher refined thoughts will get drowned out, um, and uh, the the mind will not be open to new presentations. Oh, and a lesson I learned at Oxford at the age of eighteen: um, if I prayed, my day was fruitful. If I didn't pray, my day was fruitless, no matter how hard I worked. So uh, do pray every day. Okay, a few concluding remarks. So science and divine action. I've looked at four things, miracles, providence, grace, and inspiration. And roughly speaking, 
Um, what does science, how can science help us today? It give us any tools um, to work on these things? I think science can give us help with clarification of particular instances of miracles. Um, providence, we're helped a little bit by the organic metaphors coming out of contemporary science. Grace is helping us through the whole notion of second person relatedness, which we can now put on an empirical basis, and inspiration um, through the whole issue of social insight. And I'd just like to thank the sponsors of this project, the John Templeton Foundation. Okay, final little piece. Some people will say, what on earth does faith do for our perception of the world? Um, so faith doesn't give us uh, new equations, chemicals, uh, formulae. And some people might say, well, you know, all this theology, it's, it's useless in a world of utility. But I want to just show you what I think faith does um, for the world. And I'm going to just do it through, show you through a, a brief history of art. So 1432, this was, this was um, happiness as understood in the Christian vision. The saints in the kingdom of heaven uh, gathered around the Lamb of God and the perfection of nature. Now watch what happens next. In 1524, there's a change in the art. So the saints are becoming smaller, and the focus is much more on the landscape. By 1569, the, uh, there's a church in the background, but the sh there's a huge shift in the focus of art towards nature alone. By 1821, we're at the high point of English romantic painting, Constable's The Haywain, and it's certainly very beautiful, but it's interesting what's missing, what would have been missing to an earlier generation. There are no saints or sacraments, there's no reference to Christ. All, these, all the things of the supernatural life, all things of divine action, are gone, except maybe a vague sense of God as creator. But look, look what happens next. So 1890, this is Van Gogh's last image, before he committed suicide. The road isn't going anywhere, and the vertical dimension is collapsing. And then in 1947, Jackson Pollock's Enchanted Forest. Um, I don't want to comment about that, but I just want to show you that, the, <laughs> that, there is, that there is a change in the way we perceive the world as our theological commitments change. And in the longer term, there may well be an impact even on, th even on the hard sciences like physics. Some people think that there is actually a decline, already a decline in creativity in, in science, although we are spending a lot of money on big machines. And of course, this is nihilism, which we see in society as uh, streets of London in 2011. Um, but it's not, it's not, it doesn't have to go in that direction. A few months ago, I was very privileged to go to Spain and see one of the most remarkable buildings in the world gradually emerging out of one of the most secular cities in Europe, and it's, and it's Barcelona, and this is the Sagrada Familia, and it's one of the most innovative buildings since the high Middle Ages, and uh, this mixture of Gothic art deco is eventually be 170 meters high, and it's absolutely stunning, and um, it could well set a template for architecture in the next few centuries, um, and this is all built around special divine action, the liturgy, the mass, uh, the sense of the word made flesh, and nature finds its Lord, and, and the human mind is extraordinarily creative in this context. The ultimate fruits of divine action. Beloved, we are God's children now. It does not yet appear what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, but we shall see him as he is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Don't get too comfortable. We have time for questions. Um, so if you all have any questions that you would like to ask, um, I will ask you, there's a microphone here in the middle. Um, for the sake of the recording, um, if you can come up to the microphone rather than just trying to shout from the back, that would be much appreciated. And I will give you a few minutes to make your way, lest, lest I make good on my usual threat, which is if y'all don't ask questions, I will, and your questions are much more interesting than mine. I have a question. So, at the beginning, you talked about miracles, and uh, yes. 
talked about, uh, about science as well. And I, I know the, the belief that science is the only way to know anything. That doesn't really work. That's self-defeating. But people do like science because yes. it, you can prove something with science. You can prove it to others and convince mm. others. And it seems outside science, it's hard for us to convince each other mm -hmm. of anything. So if a miracle occurred, like what's the, what are the steps that you would go through to try to oh. convince others that it, that, it, that it occurred so they could objectively know it was true? Right. I, I, I say I, I love science, too, um, and physics particularly which is very good for the quantitative behavior of two-body systems. That's really what physics does. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of the realities are much bigger than that. Um, so, um, well, actually, we actually have a mechanism. It, it, uh, I'm not, I, I don't know what, where, what your religious backgrounds are, but certainly in, in the Catholicism, we actually have a, a sort of miracle testing system, um, which is, uh, so when, 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 there's a, when there's a miracle, uh, a purported miracle, then there are various boards of people get together to decide whether there's any possible natural cause for what's happened. And the way that they adjudicate at the end is to say, well, well we, have, we, have, we, we have no natural explanation. That doesn't mean there isn't one, necessarily, but it's, it doesn't make, there is no natural way of understanding what's taken place. And this is often uh, associated with the uh, miracles of places like Lourdes or... Um, Actually, the process of canonization, because one of the uh, canonization in, in the Catholic Church is a recognition the Church accepts that someone's in heaven. And um, but one of, the, one of the signs we ask for is we want a miracle. We want to see that there's something that, 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 that's called God's way of showing us, if you like, that someone is, has that special state. And so, um, uh, so there's a process of adjudication. But the idea is you get experts together um, often it's, it's a healing of some sort. It has to be very sudden, it has to be complete. There are various other criteria. So you can look online, uh, but basically the idea is to eliminate natural causes. And what's left, um, we, uh, we have to make a judgment, of course, in the end. But we will say, yes, that's, there's probably a miracle that's taken place here. There are, have you ever heard of uh, Fatima? Uh, yeah, there are, some, there are some pretty spectacular miracles. That's uh, a few tens of thousands of people. Do argue with me if you want. It's a very general question, but basically referring to the development of science now that has gotten to a point where it doesn't quite believe in truth. Uh -huh. So it's based more on models that are applicable to a certain time right. frame, a certain mentality, etc. So how does that apply to your study here Ooh. with philosophy and theology? Gosh, that's a fascinating question. Actually, it, um, it bears on a meeting that I attended uh, just over three years ago at CERN. Have you heard of, you heard of CERN? I mean, it, it is the um, largest physics laboratory in the world. And the director general of CERN wanted to meet with philosophers and theologians for three days and to discuss, out, to discuss thrash out various issues. And one of the things that came up was, what is truth? And that, that question was debated for half a day. Um, with the um, leading scientists and so on. What did fascinate me was that, well, I'm very pleased to hear the scientists ask these questions, but also what did shock me a little bit was that they didn't know m much of the philosophical background. And this is one of the big problems we face, is that um, people who study science are not studying the history of ideas. Um, and people who study science are not studying humanities. And we, uh, to be a good scientist is good to have these other things as well. Um, but a, a, a definition of truth, a, a working definition, a correspondence between the understanding and reality, um, or a correspondence to what we say and the reality. So it's a correspondence relationship. Um, as for the whole issue of truth, yes, I mean, this is a funny, this is a funny backlash that's happening because the whole concept of truth has been eroded in other areas. It is indeed reaching into science as well, and there is a certain amount of... of, of of uh, skepticism, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what can be done about it. If, if, all I know is, if that goes too far, then we won't be able to speak about anything, and um, the skepticism will be self-defeating. So um, I, I, can, I can see the disease. I can see the decay happening, um, uh, but it, it's. 
if it goes too far, we won't be able to have a, a debate about anything because there'll be just a total skepticism left, and that's it's almost like intellectual suicide. Graduated from here not too long ago, and as, as this is, university has become more of a business, there's not that time right. in the learning curve to take humanity classes, right. uh, art classes, Right. Very narrow focus. I had my uh, curriculum set out, and I didn't get to take anything interesting. I mean, it was it was what I had to take right. to get out of here, and I couldn't learn anything else. Yeah. So the so the university settings, I think across maybe the world, at least the United States, aren't allowing this learning curve or this ability to learn outside your particular discipline. So I don't know how do we help the universities get back to where we you know right. be based on how they were in like the 1700s and 1600s. Yes. Thank you for the question. Uh, all I can say is we're fighting the same battle everywhere. So um, at Oxford, there's a, a sort of renegade philosopher called Roger Scruton. And he used to work in behind the Iron Curtain before the fall of the Berlin Wall. And he actually helped to run the underground universities in Eastern Europe, um, uh, learning to work in these uh, socialist dictatorships, which is more or less what he has to do today in some university acad <laughs> academies. But it's, um, the, yeah, there is this, 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 this crushing drive towards utility production. And we've got to resist that. Um, we've got to have time to do useless things. Um, and in fact, the philosopher Aristotle said that um, the highest kind of wisdom is to do useless things. And he says, um, if the Egyptian priests hadn't had the leisure time to do useless things, they would never have invented mathematics. So uh, we've got to step, step away from things. All I can do is you've got to fight for time. You've got to fight for time to, start to look at ideas, discuss ideas, get into groups. And if that doesn't come from the courses, well, create your own courses, create your own discussion groups, reading groups. Um, find a way of, of getting a, 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 an education that's a bit broader. It's a wonderful series by the way, if you want a, crash, a fast crash course on the history of ideas and art, I recommend Civilization by Kenneth Clark. Uh, Civilization, which I think now very available on YouTube, or you can buy it online for a few dollars, and it's probably the best thing the BBC ever made. They probably couldn't do it today. Okay. So um, that, that, that would be very good. And there are a few other superb books like this, but we're all fighting the same battle against um, uh, the machine, you might say. Um, could you uh, discuss the relationship of love and miracles, or love and yes. grace? Yes. Briefly. Um, <laughs> got to work out how, how to define love. And love is one of the most overused and, and misused words. So there's love in the sense of desire. Um, but actually, the kind of love that we're talking about in the context of grace, has two desires, a desire for the good of the other and a desire for union, communion, or friendship with the other. And if you haven't got both those desires, it's not genuine love. So um, if it's, uh, I desire good, of, good for you, but I don't want to ha have anything to do with you, um, that's, that's not genuine, that's cold benevolence. Or on the other hand, uh, a desire for union, communion, or friendship, which doesn't really desire the good of the other, is some kind of exploitation. So um, you've got to have those two desires together, and that fits in with the pattern of grace as being second personal, loving with God the things God loves. As for the concept of miracles, theologically, I think miracles get things going in the sense that um, if you look at the story of the book of Exodus, there are lots of miracles near the beginning, getting the people out of Egypt. But then what happens? 40 years in the wilderness. By the way, did you know it's also the story of a human soul? Did you know that? Book of Exodus. So it so starts with original sin, that's Egypt. Crossing the Red Sea, that's baptism. Forty years in the wilderness, that's this life. But we're fed with bread from heaven every day. It's white bread on the ground. Well, I know what, I know what that is. Um, <laughs> then you cross the river of death, that's the river Jordan, into the promised land, the kingdom of heaven. So actually, the Old Testament is the New Testament for the right brain hemisphere. It is, um, it is 
giving us God's metaphors for revealed truth. And it's, it's absolutely, um, it brings a lot, of these, a lot of the truths to life. Otherwise, they just remain as cold propositions. So if you see Jesus saves us from our sins, it's, um, that's, just a, that's just a statement. But if you can imagine um, the rock being struck in the desert and water coming out to, to, to quench the thirst of people dying of thirst, that's an embodied image of salvation in the, in the, uh, in the desert. So, so the Old Testament gives us the New Testament with the right brain and hemisphere. I forgot where I got to in this answer. I got quite excited by it. Um, but the summer of what I to say. Oh, miracles get things out. So miracles get things started. So in the, in the Old Testament, um, book of Exodus, miracles get them out of Egypt in the 40 years in the wilderness. Um, when Augustine, St. Augustine was sent to England to convert the Saxons, we have a letter from Pope Gregory um, afterwards saying, you're doing great work, but don't get too proud of your ability to work miracles. So um, there's a certain pride. You see, the problem with miracles is about power. And power is addictive for human beings, um, which is why God likes to wean us off it. And um, the miracles can get things going, but really it's the life of grace and the love of God which really counts in the longer term. So, so the miracles are like the engine to kick start, but it's the life of grace that's important in the longer term. All right, Father, so there's, there's a really specific topic I want to talk to you about, and that's metaphysical personhood. Wow, um, yes. So, uh, are you familiar with like the physical and psychological approaches? Um, well, th there's a huge, a huge, a huge um, library of material on personhood. Um, what I would say is that persons are the unique Christian idea in metaphysics, and there's a book by this by a German philosopher. It's called "The Difference Between Someone and Something." And the reason why persons came along in the first place was to solve two problems in theology, one of which is the incarnation, and the other is the Trinity. And they discovered the toolkit of Greek philosophy wasn't big enough to accommodate all those things. So in the fourth century, um, the great battle was over homoousios, one substance. So they said the Father and the Son are one substance. So Jesus is no less God than the Father. But then um, they ran out of tools. So, so how they, what is the distinction of the Father and the Son? Well, Greek philosophy doesn't give you a tool for that. So they, adapt, they gradually adapted two terms. One was persona in Latin, which became person, and hypostasis in Greek. And as a byproduct of that, we got the term person. Um, and we became persons because if we are adopted children of God, then we in fact, share some of that personhood um, with Jesus Christ. And so the whole, the whole emergence of the individual and the individual person uh, really stems from, stems from this development. So what are persons? Well, you can't express persons in terms of more basic things. There's no species, no genus. Um, you can't, uh, Boeth, the Boethian definition of an individual substance of rational nature is inadequate. It's an attempt to write it back into an older system. We get our sense of persons from our sense of second persons. We get our sense of uh, the I emergence in relationship to a you. Which is why when we began to relate to God as I to you, we ourselves changed as a result, and civilization changed as a result of that. Um, one way I like to illustrate this is the distinction between Roman and Christian armies in the early centuries. Uh, and as I said, several people from the military here that mentioned this. So the Romans had legionaries. And legionaries were depersonalized killing machines. And basically, after five years, you could just order them to march up a cliff, and they would do it. Right? Um, but when Christians had to deal with civic defense and, and defending against barbarians and so on, then um, they began to organize armies of their own. But um, they didn't go back to the legionary model. And uh, what emerged was the knight. And the knight is a personality. So even the art of soldiery became something... Um, that became, took on a specifically Christian dimension as a result of, of, this, cha of this understanding of the, per of the person. In fact, the, the soldier also became a romantic figure. So there's all kinds of things the classical world would never have thought of um, um, putting together. Thank you. Um, what's your viewpoint on meditation? I think it's a good idea. Um, but 
But I had to, no, here, no here's, the, here's the problem. No, he, <laughs> okay, I better qualify that. I prefer, I, prefer, I prefer the term prayer to meditation. The problem is with meditation is that uh, it can be interpreted as an emptying of the mind. I don't think that's very healthy. I think we're meant to communicate as I to thou, um, uh, to, to God. Uh, the challenge is how to pray. That's not so easy. Um, I've been gradually memorizing the Psalms for the last um, 10 years or so. By the time I'm in my 60s, I shall know as much as a 15-year-old boy at the time of Jesus. Um, it's good to memorize chunks of scripture, uh, holy prayers, because this is tried and tested. And I, I find this is the, um, forms the backbone of most of my prayer life. Briefly, before you ask, you're going to sit down. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to say that the line, we're going to cut off the line and say the last questioner is the last person in line now. So, so good job getting with, to the end of the line. With the Jesuit wrestling t-shirt. Go for it. Yes. Hello. Um, I'm Hello. a PhD student and have found from my own personal experience that the dispositions of those who, I guess, acquiesce into the academy have, um, are very similar and are not necessarily the folks that would be a proponent of such philosophy of more of the affective side of the brain that would bring in these types oh, of things. okay. And um, would be interested in uh, your opinion on how um, those of us who are square pegs uh, would fit into that, the future of the academy to bring back the creativity to right. these sorts of things. Right. Um, I wish I had an easy answer to this, because except we're all fighting the same battle, uh, including in philosophy faculties. Um, there's a this, this desire to publish papers and churn stuff out uh, maybe not always with much thought. Um, we've got to somehow create space for other things. Um, but just just broaden the scope of reading. Talk, and actually, talk to other people about what they do. So if there's someone you, um, you admire who seems to have a rounded education, find out what do you read, you know? Um, how do you find out these things? And then, um, because the, the world is full of books, and there are millions of books, but how do you know where to start? And normally the best is, is, to, is to ask someone else. So, so I, I, have a, I had a professor in America, here, here in America, Eleanor Stump. And she's, um, I always think of her a bit like the oracle in the Matrix. So she, she, she answers a question I'll think of in five minutes' time. But she's, um, she, every now and again, she'll just suggest, you know, you should look at that book. You know, look at that book. And, and she's normally right. So... Um, uh, find 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 wise people, and and talk to them. I find, uh, unfortunately, in our world and here, so many people don't see things as you and as probably most of us in this room that science and divine things are. They they feel they are opposed. And the most common example I can think of, for example, is creationism versus evolution. Right. What do you think our way forward could be, should be, will be on things like what should be taught in schools yes. and yes. that sort of thing? I better come back for that talk. That's a big, that's a big topic. <laughs> um, I'll give you roughly the, the, the Catholic official position, um, which is that um, we're not... We're not hostile to evolution um, properly understood, but evolution is a broad term, and there are ways of interpreting it which are hostile to Christianity, and there are some which are not. Um, we don't have too much of a problem with the idea of secondary causation, and what I mean by that is God has given his creatures the dignity of being causes. Um, so I think it's a mistake to, um, to, to sort of go in all guns blazing and to... Um, to, to create wars where, where none need to exist. Um, but, uh, it, it's, I, uh, I, would, I would, if personally I would, I would teach evolution in school, but I would also teach uh, a good philosophy of understanding it. Because we're not required to believe that because of evolution we're nothing but mammals. Um, and here, what helps me a little bit is, is the study of things like complex systems. So one of the lies we're told is that if you, if you gradually change the input conditions, like a set of genes, then you get a similar gradual change of output conditions in terms of an organism. But it doesn't work like that with complex systems. You can have a small change which causes a sudden shift. 
And I think part of the interesting, one of the interesting philosophical battles over evolution is, is it gradual? Or do we get, if you like, phase changes or shifts? Um, the phase change shift model is, I think, much more amenable to, to Christian philosophy. Um, but I say this is a hugely complicated issue, so I think I'd probably have to say, I wouldn't want to say too, more, too much more about that, because I think it deserves a talk on its own, in its own right. But perhaps we could, we could talk later, if, if, uh, if, you, if you like. Thank you. Oh, interesting, interesting. Well, I could just give you a couple of throwaway lines, very, very important. So when people say um, human beings are nothing but animals, um, you can use a few lines from Chesterton. So uh, birds build nests, but they do not build nests in the Gothic style. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I have a sort of a series of questions, probably, depending on what one? you say. Can you choose one? Okay. Choose your favorite. Well, it, it's, it sort of all goes into line into the, into the main question that I want to get to. Uh, do you, do because you, it's an argument that I've sort of been having with a friend of mine, and I just want to see what you think of it. So, do you believe it's good to have an open mind? Um, well, <laughs> it's not, but not so open. My brains fall out. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but we'll yes, be it. open to new presentations of the world and listen. Yeah. Yes. yes, yeah. Okay, so what? Well, my sort of stance on it was that, um, like God, God's able to do anything, right? God can do anything. So. What my thing was is seeing the possibility that God could also, say for example, lie. But oh, okay, okay. just just have it, just having it there as a possibility doesn't necessarily mean it's uh, okay. it's like something that I believe because what's truth is is aside from what's the possibility, right? Am, am I wrong in thinking that? Right. Or okay, so. Um this is a very, uh, this is a debated question. What is the limit, if there is such a thing, as the limit of God's power? And uh, I can give you the mainstream Christian answer, which is that um, God can't um, create a contradiction, can't, can't live in a state of contradiction, and lying is a contradiction, because there's a, contra there's a contradiction between what one says and what one understands. So... Um, uh, just God can't overwrite the past, for example. So anything that involves a contradiction is normally regarded as out of bounds for divine action. Not because it's really a limit of God's action, but because it's, um, it, it's a kind of action that doesn't make sense because it is, se it is self contradictory. Okay, yeah. The, but it's sort of like, um, is, is it wrong to, to think of it as that, as that being a, a possibility still, though, even though it is a All contradiction? Right. Uh, I, if it's specifically the topic of lying, I would say I would be, I would be very cautious of that, even as a possibility, because yeah. um, Christianity and Judaism, particularly, have a particular hatred of lying. And part of the reason is that um, you can't be friends with a liar. And the whole of, you can't properly be friends with a liar. And the whole of the idea of hu human flourishing in the Christian tradition, particularly, is friendship with God. Uh, a liar is, is internally contradicted. So um, uh, there's, it, it's, uh, the devil is called the father of lies in, 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 in Scripture. So um, lying is, is not something I would ever want to attribute to God. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I was just wondering, what is your stand on Young Earth versus Big Bang? Uh, oh, um, well, I'm rather keen on the Big Bang, uh, as it was invented by a priest. And, um, and remember, it was, it was the atheists who hated it. Um, uh, they spent 30 years trying to get rid of it. Um, we, we got used to it now. But if you said to someone 100 years ago, the universe exploded out of a point, I mean, how much more miraculous do you want? And the fact, the fact is that's actually what we believe today. We've got used to it. That doesn't mean it's not any less amazing. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's, it, it, not only is modern, modern cosmology acceptable, but actually it was, it was much more acceptable to Christians than many atheists when it first came along. Um, as for the, the, the young earth views, I mean, you may have a variety of views on these things, but um, I, I don't think we're required to, to hold a young earth view. From, from from scripture properly understood. And in fact, 
Augustine knew this back in the 5th century because he said um, the sun and moon are created on the fourth day. So we cannot be talking about days in the literal sense. And Augustine was no liberal. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Father. Uh, my question is, uh, in terms of like metaphysics, uh, at what point um, did we philosophically lose God? And um, oh gosh. And <laughs> and yeah, that's a bit, that's my question. At what point did we philosophically and, and, oh, lose God? God? And um, what was like the error that they made? Right. That's a fascinating issue, and certainly up to about 1900, I think. Um, to do philosophy and, and I mean, God talk and philosophy talk came pretty much pretty close. I mean, it's very uh, it's very hard to do philosophy without getting to God talk sooner or later, because philosophy is about. Anyone know a definition of philosophy? Love of wisdom. Although I recommend you can go one step further. So love of wisdom and wisdom deals with first causes and principles of things. So biology, for example, deals with the, me the mechanics of the human body, among other things. Um, but philosophy will say all human beings seek happiness. That's the first principle of human action. Um, and when, when you're dealing with first causes and principles, you're already getting to the God talk, because God is the first cause. So um, the only way you can avoid that in philosophy, um, really, ultimately, is to attack the notion of causation. And that's that is, um, we owe part of that to David Hume. So, so it's like if, if causation is the rungs of, um, represents the rungs of a ladder, with, with God as first cause at the end of the ladder, um, Hume spent his time taking away the rungs of the ladder. So, so that's one way in which you can uh, get, rid of, uh, get rid of God in philosophy. Uh, but you pay a heavy price for that in terms of, of losing um, other kinds of, of knowledge. Um, the, the, the curious thing today is that modern academic philosophy is quite atheistic. Um, but that's a bit of an anomaly at the, uh, if you look at the longer term perspective. M most of the great philosophers of history have talked about God. They've had very different views about who and what God is. Um, but, um, but God is certainly part of natural philosophy. Hi, so this, this is just kind of like a statement I'm wondering if you would agree with. Um, just something uh, my personal belief. Um, I believe that it's not really a battle as far as the science versus religion thing. I believe it's not necessarily a battle of science versus religion, but a battle against worldviews. Yes. Um, evidence, evidence really proves nothing unless someone can give an interpretation on it. Absolutely. Which is based on someone's worldview. Yes. Um, an example I like to give is, uh, sorry, I'm Ben's calling me. Uh, <laughs> the example I like to give is that geologists have the evidence of Grand Canyon. Um, however, naturalists would like to view it as millions of years of sedimentation, but creationists see it as worldwide flood of Noah's day. And I'm wondering, would you agree that it is a battle of worldviews on science, which I believe the definition of that is the study of knowledge, rather than a battle of science versus religion? Thank you for that. And, and I agree that, that actually probably is the main battleground. It's often not really over uh, science and facts. Uh, it's much more over the narratives and the worldviews, which is why most of the of the clever players in this whole area are masters of metaphor. So there's a famous um, New Atheist writer in England who, who takes the term gene and he puts the word selfish beside it. And that's actually turning a biological thing into, in, into something which has a whole um, connotation attached to it, which, which a biology alone doesn't have. So um, y yes, absolutely, we're very aware of metaphors. There's a whole um, debate and tradition as a whole um, uh, the many philosophical works specifically on this question a very famous pa paper called Gods um, which presents something called the parable of the gardener so if you google parable of the gardener that's a very interesting philosophical um, 
uh, exploration of this issue of how two people can two people can see the same things um, with different uh, with different eyes. Um, I, I don't have much more to say about that except that if one's presented with one worldview, it's very important to be aware of, of it as a worldview and be aware of, of other perspectives. So often the challenge for an intelligent Christian is to break the spell. The spell says you work within this world, a certain kind of world, which is set by these parameters. And um, one of the best challenges you can make is often to break the spell and say, well, yeah, thank you, but that's not the only way of looking at the world. I can look at it this way as well. So um, uh, no, it's, it's very, very important to be aware of these issues. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So we've come to that unfortunate point where I have to stand up and say, that's all we have time for. But thank you all very much for coming. Thank yes. you very much for your attention and your participation. And thank yes. you, Father Vincent, um, for, for thank you. Thank you.